Hey, welcome to our first exam review for Calculus 1 for the fall 2021 semester. Um, in this review, we're just going to be going over some problems that we think exemplify some of the ideas that might be tested on your exam. Like, of course, the problem that's on your screen right now. So, in this problem, we are told that f is a continuous function, and it's uh, defined on this entire interval from negative 4 to 2. They say that some of the values for f are shown in the table below, uh, emphasis on some. Which of the following statements is correct? Or select all that are true. So the first statement says that f of x is 0 has a solution on the interval negative 1 to 2. Negative 1 to 2. So what we want to do is look for our x values, negative 1 to 2, and they look like they're right here. Okay, and um, since f is continuous, we can only say that this has a solution if it satisfies the intermediate value theorem. However, if we look, all of these values are positive. The only way we can say that this must have a solution is if one of the values is positive and at least one of the other values is negative. So we can say that this is not necessarily true. Okay, the next question. Uh, the limit as x approaches 0 of f of x is equal to 1. So we take a look at our x value at 0, and we see that the f of x value is equal to 1. Now what does that mean? We know that f is continuous. Continuous means that everywhere the limit equals the function value value and since the function value is 1 the limit at 0 has to be 1 this is true fill in that bubble however you like now the next statement f of x equals 0 must have exactly one solution in the interval negative 4 to negative 2 now notice in this interval, negative 4 to negative 2, we actually have a 0, we have a negative 5, we have a negative 7. So we know that there's at least one solution, but we don't know anything about what f of x looks like. It could look um, something like this. Um, negative 2. I'm not going to worry. It could look something like that, right? Um, the point being, you have no idea how many solutions something might have. So saying there's exactly one is not applicable. Okay, final statement. f of x equals zero must have at least two solutions on the interval negative four to zero. So let's, let's count, let's count. Um, by the intermediate value theorem, um, well, the first one, we don't even need that. The first one, oh look, there's a zero there. All right, so I, I made negative four, so I count one. Negative 3, I never necessarily cross. Negative 2, never necessarily cross. But at negative 1, take a look at this. My f values went from negative to positive. That means I did something, like I went down here, to up here. So there has to be a solution. So that there's at least two. Yes, and that's all they asked for, so yes, this is true. Okay, let's move on to the next problem. Okay, um, so in this next problem, we have a sort of pictograph that every letter in this graph has something to do with this guy, the limit definition of the, the derivative. So if we take a look, um, we're told that a and a plus h, the distance between them is e. The only way that works is if h is e. Now, f of a, um, that's really you just look at the graph of f of x, which is this line, and you look where a is. Oh, that's this value over here. The letter f of a is a. Similarly, f of a plus h, that's b over here. Um, f of a minus f or whatever f of a plus h minus f of a that's the distance between 
this point and this point, and if we look over here, that letter is marked by F. Okay, now, the question is, what is this guy? What is this guy? Well, this is the slope of the line that connects these two points, which is marked by D. See, this is before the limit. Now they notice it says after the limit, after the limit of H approaches zero, and that's actually going to be our tangent line, which is marked by C. Okay, uh, let's take a moment and then move on to the next problem. So this problem says, determine the value of p so that the function is continuous and x equals negative 8. So take a look. Um, in this problem, in this function, you normally can't plug in negative 8 here, right? Because then you'd have 0 on this denominator. No bueno. So they say that this function only holds for x is not negative 8. Clever, eh? Then they say we're going to be equal to p at x equals negative 8. Now, a function is continuous if the function value is equal to the limit at uh, any given point. So that what that means is that we need to take the limit as x approaches negative 8 of this guy, of f of x. And that will actually give us the value for p. So we're looking at this. And typically, we want to go ahead and try to factor if we can. Um, 7 times x minus 8 times x plus 8 divided by x plus 8. Oh, and notice that these x plus 8s will cancel. So this will be equal to the limit as x approaches negative 8, the 7x minus 8. And that is going to be equal to 7 times negative 16, uh, which I don't have a calculator on me. I think that's negative 112. Thus, in order for the function value, which they tell us is p, to be equal to the limit, and since the limit is one negative 112, p has to be negative 112. Moving on. Here they give us the graph, a weird looking graph of a function, and they ask for a removable discontinuity. So actually, in the previous problem, we just looked at a removable discontinuity, uh, where we could just say, the function's equal to this value, and then it's continuous. So let's look at this graph. Um, removable discontinuities are typically like little holes, like this guy. Jumps, yeah, those aren't removable. Um, asymptotes, those aren't very removable either. Cusps, well, actually, those aren't even discontinuities. You just can't take a derivative there. So looking at this, the only place where there is a removable discontinuity on the graph, that is just a hole that you could fill in if you wanted, that looks like it's at x equals 1. Woo -woo -woo. Okay, uh, moving on. So here they want to uh, make, the test givers want to make sure that you understand what derivatives look like and what they mean. So here we have the graph of y equals f of x, and we are asked something about the derivative f prime of x. And they're asking, what intervals is f prime of x greater than zero? Now, for the derivative f prime to be positive, that means the slope of your in graph is increasing. Your graph is increasing. So let's take a look at the intervals in which we're increasing. So if I look from here all the way up to, it looks like here, I'm decreasing. And then I start going up. So from negative 5 to 3, I go up. Then I go back down. So down, 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 down. 
Now, um, if once I get back to 10, look, I start going back up, I start going up again. And it looks like I don't stop going up. That's what those arrows mean. So looking at this, I'm going to say that our intervals of increasing or where the derivative is positive, it's going to be negative 5 to, we said, 3 over here. And then from 10 to infinity. So you might ask, how did I know that these uh, were parentheses instead of brackets? Whenever we're asking about intervals of increasing or decreasing, we actually always use parentheses. Um, well, almost always. Somebody could come up with a scenario that you don't. But the idea is that at this point, like 5, negative 5, we're flat. We're horizontal. Which means that we are neither increasing nor decreasing. And same here. So we don't include those points. We don't include the endpoints of these intervals. Basically, this matches up with this solution. Okay, moving on to our second to last problem. Here, we're asked to do something that typically math students don't like to do, and that is to explain in words why this sort of situation makes sense. So they say that f is a differentiable function and k is a constant. That's the key word. Explain why this guy is equal to this guy. And note, your explanation should address the ideas of rate of change and the meaning of a derivative. You might be thinking to yourself, wait, but wait, isn't Aren't these two things just the same, different ways of writing the same thing? And the answer is actually no. These are not the same way or the different ways of writing the same thing. Here on the left, we're saying that this is the rate of change of this whole function, f of x plus k, with respect to x. And that's actually equal to the rate of change of the function f with respect to x whenever you plug in x plus k for x. Now, this is really closely related to the chain rule, actually. Okay, so we could prove this to ourselves with the chain rule really quickly. The next thing we'll have to do is just put it into words. So, d dx of f of x plus k is going to be equal to, according to the chain rule, f prime of x plus k times the derivative of the stuff on in the inside. That's the chain rule. But if you look at that, what's the derivative of this stuff on the, x, on the inside, x plus k? Well, k is a constant, so it's actually just 1. Wait, but why? Well, this is where we put things into words. We say um, the derivative of the function f of x plus k is the rate of change of f of x plus k with respect to x. Since x plus k grows at, oh, I'm messing up with my writing, grows at the same rate as x, f prime of x plus k 
is equal to d dx f of x plus k. Now, if you wanted to, you could insert something uh, like here-ish, here-ish, saying because k is a constant. Okay, um, if you have any more questions about that idea specifically, just leave a comment. I kind of breezed over that pretty quickly. But let's go ahead and move on to our last problem. Here, we're asked to use the limit definition of the derivative to show that if f of x is equal to negative 4 over x, then df dx, when x is equal to 2, is equal to 1. This is essentially a fancy way of asking you to take the derivative using the limit definition and then plug in 2. So let's go ahead and do that right now. The limit definition of this says that the limit as um, h approaches 0 over f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. Now this is going to be the limit as h approaches 0 of, well, what's f of x plus h? That's negative 4 over x plus h minus negative 4 over x. I suppose I could have made those a plus, divided by h. Now, this is going to be equal to, I want, my idea is that I want to combine the fractions into a single fraction. To do so, I have to multiply negative 4 um, over here, well, it, we need a common denominator, is basically what I'm trying to say. Which means that we multiply this fraction by x plus h on the top and the bottom, and this fraction by x. So we've got negative 4x over x times x plus h, plus, I'm just going to go ahead and do plus, because the minus minus, 4 times x plus h, divided by x times x plus h all over h limit as h approaches zero okay now we can combine this into a single fraction so that's going to turn into negative 4x plus um, x plus h on the bottom we've got i'm going to go ahead and distribute the four out here to 4x plus 4h. And the idea of that is, as you'll notice, these 4x's are going to cancel out. And we're left with, um, also this h will just come here onto the denominator. The limit as h approaches 0 of 4h divided by x times x plus h times h. Now, conveniently, we get rid of this h on the bottom by canceling out of the top, and we're now able to plug in a 0 for h, and we see that this limit turns into 4 over x squared. Now, that means if df dx is 4 over x squared, Whenever you evaluate at x equals 2, you're going to get 4 over 2 squared, which is 4 over 4, which is equal to 1. In, a, in my world, we say QED, which is a fancy Latin way of saying, as was to be shown. All right, that's the end of this review. Like I said, if you have any questions about what happened here, just leave a comment and we will try to get uh, to you quickly. Good luck on studying. Bye.